tell us what has made you so successful in your career. Well, I might be a little modest in saying I'm so successful, but I think uh, there's a lot of factors that probably help me in, in the success I've had in life. I think uh, I've always had lofty goals. I wanted to achieve big things, and uh, I believed I could do that. I had parents who encouraged me to, to be the best that I could and, and try to do anything in life that I believed in. Um, I've, I've found things that I enjoy doing and have a passion for and a uh, commitment to. Um, I've been able to build, I think, good networks and good support systems. Um, I find people who have similar interests and commitment and desires in life that uh, help me. So there's a number of different things I think that have helped me be as successful as I've been. What kind of advice would you give to young people who are trying to succeed in the business world today, especially in this economy? Well, I think you the first thing is determine what is important to you. What is it that you want in your life? Uh, what would you like to contribute to society and the community? And find something that's uh, a, a passion for you. Uh, and then I think identify people, networks, resources that can help you. I think you have to be patient. Uh, you have to do some of the hard work along the way. Uh, people often say that I have a great job. I'm a professor um, and I can I write and I travel all over the world and I, my schedule is my own. I can work from my home. And I respond and say, yes, my life is very enjoyable now and I have a, an opportunity to, to impact people throughout the world. But I spent many years uh, doing a lot of research and writing, uh, working at low levels in some difficult situations, uh, commuting long distances and so forth. But uh, uh, I think if you make the sacrifice and you have a goal in which you're going to, I think that uh, can certainly help you. As a professor at George Washington University, I'm sure you have an opinion about this. What makes a really great professor or teacher? Well, I think... Uh, First is that the professor has to love learning himself or herself, that they enjoy learning. Uh, they always look for ways to increase their learning. They're excited about learning. And, uh, and then they have a belief in that any student, uh, if you provide them support, the environment, encouragement, opportunities, uh, that they can learn, that there's no such thing as a person who cannot learn. And so a belief that the student can learn if you do your, your job as the uh, professor. I think it's important uh, that the learning you provide, it, you, that the student sees relevance for it and value for it, uh, whether it's immediately in the classroom or when they leave the classroom, but they have to find some benefit in their learning. And so I think uh, part of what I believe is important for learning is that you try to create either problems that they are currently encountering or will encounter as the foundation from which their knowledge uh, can be learned and applied. So how do you define a learning organization? Well, a learning organization is an organization that continuously improves. So as it, it, it operates in an environment with clients and customers and competitors and so forth, so a learning organization has the ability to continuously improve as it interacts with the environment. And so it recognizes that it has to continuously learn. And from every experience it has, it improves it. So the next time that they have an interaction with a particular customer or a, a client or a competitor or a situation, they do it better. They're continuously uh, scanning the environment so that they can be aware of what the future might be like. And uh, But a learning organization uh, is able to take information and convert it into knowledge and wisdom and, and move quickly from ideas and information to products and services. In the book, you talk about eight significant forces, per se, that necessitate a, a shift across the landscape to learning organization models. Can you talk just briefly about those uh, significant forces? Sure. I think... Uh, a uh, little bit of background, you know, 50 years ago, organizations did not have to learn or learn very fast because the environment was not changing very much and there was less competition. 
and customers had fewer choices and so forth. So organizations could survive uh, being a, either, either a slow learning organization or almost a non-learning organization. But today's environment, the uh, forces for change are so great and complex and fast that only learning organizations can survive and succeed. And so there's a number of forces uh, that have caused the need for organizations to learn continuously. I think the first uh, obvious one is that uh, uh, globalization and global competition. Uh, you have to learn because you're no longer competing against either a no organization in your country or weak organizations. You now are competing with the, the best organizations from around the world who have, you know, perhaps a, a greater resources and uh, opportunities and so forth. I think the, the second major change in the last 20 years has been the, the impact of technology. Uh, 20 years ago, the internet was just beginning. We did not have things such as smartphones or mobile learning. But the, the technology has dramatically changed uh, you know, the environment and what can be done and what cannot be done. And so uh, I remember when I did my doctoral research, I, I had to uh, have all my information key punched and rented a room for an hour to do my my computer research and now it's done in a few seconds on uh, a small little phone. So, t but technology affects uh, everything in terms of distance and uh, relationships and uh, information, et cetera. Uh, the third is, and those two factors affect the workplace. Uh, you know, people don't go to the office anymore to work or they may work for a number of different organizations at the same time. They may have several bosses or no bosses. Uh, they may be working more closely with a supervisor in, uh, in uh, Tokyo than their uh, person who's, work who's in the office right across the hall from them. So the work world has changed uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, I think a fourth difference is that uh, customers have much more power because of technology and global you know, competition and so forth. Uh, any customer can... And we used to have to go to the local store to buy a book. And now I can order a book uh, online or any service I want online. I have much more power as a customer. So I want the best price and I can choose the world to do that. I want it customized to my needs. I want innovative things that can prepare me for the future. I want high quality. And if anything goes wrong, I want it to be fixed immediately at a, a low cost. So, this is putting a lot of pressure on organizations to learn. I think a fifth is that what we do in organizations is very different. Uh, we use a term called manufacturing. Now, most of us worked with our hands and with machines, but now most of the work that we do is with our brains. We call it mental factoring. Now, most of us are knowledge workers, and we spend much of our day learning to prepare for an interview with someone, to prepare for a customer, to handle a project. So most of our day now is, is spent in learning for some particular event or action as opposed to eight hours on an assembly line. So, so the type of work we do and the type of workers we have is different. Um, I think another challenge or force that's causing a need to have learning organizations is that workers have, particularly the, the best workers, great workers, they have high expectations. They have the ability to work on their own or work for other organizations uh, via technology. So to retain and attract these top workers, the organization has to have an environment which gives them the opportunity to, to learn, to be creative, to have impact. Uh, a seventh, I think, challenge or force we have is that there's more diversity in the workplace. We have people from all different cultures, uh, uh, short term, long term, uh, all types of experiences, uh, people with a variety of experiences and, and capabilities have to work together. And I think the final forces, and they, they all come, come together, is that we have great complexity in the world and we cannot understand it by linear thinking or uh, line of sight thinking. We have to do what we call systems thinking, 
Uh, we have to understand complexity, that things change very rapidly and everything that is done impacts other things. So I think all these factors, these eight forces have resulted in organizations needing to continuously learn and improve or else they die. In your book, you talk about a systems learning organizational model, and this is where you start to get really practical. Tell us a little bit about that and what it entails. Okay, when I began looking, beginning my research in learning organizations, and, and I did that by looking at what organizations around the world did best, those that were considered the best organizations, uh, what were some of the things they did? And I discovered there were kind of five generic areas in which great organizations did things very well, where they learned and continuously improved. And so what I developed was a systems model, uh, recognizing, again, complexity and, and understanding the, the workplace and, and competitors and so forth. You had to do it from a systems perspective. And so there are five different systems that have to be integrated seamlessly for a learning organization to be fully effective and, and fully powerful. The first is is the learning itself. Um, a learning organization makes learning the center of it of its existence. That the purpose of an organization is more learning than action, because if the organization is not learning, the product they're offering and the service they offer quickly becomes irrelevant or too costly or whatever. So learning's the essence. And there's all types of learning. There's learning we gain from experience. Uh, there's learning we gain from planning, scenario planning, anticipatory learning. And there's learning we gain from being reflective and, and conscious of what's happening while it's happening, what I'll, I call action learning. So you learn while you're in action. And so all those elements are key for the types of learning. You have to learn at the individual a group and organization wide level and there's a number of skills that are important for the learning uh, system of an organization. Uh, people have to be able to learn on their own because they, their boss doesn't have the answers or the, the learning is needed at that moment in time. Um, they have to know what makes them a master, they have to become an expert in their particular area of responsibility. I think a key learning skill is the ability to do systems thinking, systems learning, so you can identify the essence of a problem and identify strategies that work across. I think uh, we have to be able to learn through dialogue and questions, so questioning is an important skill. So the learning subsystem, that's, that's kind of the elements of a learning subsystem. The uh, second system in a learning organization is the uh, how the organization itself is structured and its vision and its values. So a learning organization uh, is committed to continuous learning. It has strategies that encourage learning so that uh, if you want to have people in your organization committed to learning, you have to reward their learning. I think uh, most organizations, they get rewarded for the results he has and whether right. sales or you know, whatever the, the issue may be. And a learning organization recognizes that actions or results are only short term and they do not necessarily continue, whereas learning can be applied continuously. So that, for example, if you, in a learning organization, the strategy is to reward learning. So when people come in for their performance appraisal, you not only ask them for what results they've provided over the last six months or a year, but what have they learned that enables them to be more productive and they could use that learning in the future? But even more importantly, what have they learned that they have contributed to other members of the organization so they are learning? Because that's the, the power of linking and leveraging right. all the learning. So you have to reward people for taking time to share their knowledge or learning with other people in the organization. So you have to reward that because if you only get rewarded for your own work, you're not going to take the time or effort to go down the hall or go across the street or right. light up something that will benefit other people and not benefit yourself. Mm -hmm. So also the, the organization has to change its structure and, and most organizations are still 
running as if it was an industrial age rather than a learning age. So organizations have hierarchies and silos and so forth. And if knowledge is your most important asset as a learning organization, you have to enable the knowledge to go quickly throughout the organization in an accurate way. And so any structures or policies or hierarchy that slows the information or filters it and uh, causes it to lose its value or, or become incorrect is to be avoided. So learning organizations have to change you know, their whole way of, of how they structure. Uh, they have learning places as opposed to workplaces. Uh, you see people around you as fellow learners as opposed to fellow workers. And so that's the, the, the concept. So that's the second system is the organization itself. Third is, are the people within the organization. So uh, everyone from the leader to every employee, the vendors, suppliers, uh, even the community have to be involved in the learning organization. Because what good is it if you have great leaders and great employees, but your supplier is a non-learning organization, is very slow, very ineffective poor quality, uh, or if your dealers are not able to sell the great product that you've developed at a good cost and so forth. So through, through the, the people system and people with, and a leader's most important role is to help the people around him become learners because the more he does that, the more the organization becomes a learning organization. Uh, the fourth subsystem of a learning organization is the the knowledge, the knowledge itself. And so learning organizations have to find the best ways to acquire knowledge from other sources, uh, best practices, conferences, research that's being done. Uh, they have to create their own new knowledge. They have to have environments and reward systems that encourage creativity and give people opportunity to create new knowledge. You have to find a way to store knowledge in a way in which people throughout the organization can find it when they need it. Most of our knowledge is either it's just junk that's stored and no one ever uses it because it's of no value or they cannot find that which is of value. So the knowledge has to create a storage system so it's, it's relevant to the, to the learning needs of people in the organization and they can find it when they need to. And then the knowledge, you have to be able to disseminate it, uh, get it to the right people at the right time, just when they need it, just in time learning. Uh, and you have to continually assess that knowledge so that you can either retain it, uh, get rid of it, uh, convert it into a higher form of knowledge, such as wisdom and, and expertise. And the final subsystem in my uh, book, Building Learning Organization, and is the technology. And technology has two major purposes. One is to increase the speed and quality of learning of every employee and every leader in the organization, uh, whether it be through mobile learning, uh, internet learning, uh, but whatever way to get the learning to be exciting, relevant, and valuable. And then technology also has to manage all that knowledge that is gained and needs to be reacquired and so forth. So. That's briefly the five subsystems of the particular learning organization model that I've developed over the years. When you're building a learning organization like this, what are some of the principles of learning that um, you can sort of rely upon to help navigate through that process? I think you've brought out a good point that most organizations would like to become learning organizations because of the the significant strategic advantage they gain by being a learning organization. However, becoming a learning organization can be quite complex and take a lot of time. And so many organizations have given up trying to be a learning organization and they redefine learning organization well, we manage our knowledge and do the best we can. And so I realize, you know, over the years I've been working with learning organizations for over 20 years, I realize that very few organizations were able to make that leap into becoming a successful learning organization. And over the past probably five or seven years, I realized that the most effective way and quickest way to develop a learning organization was to begin changing the culture of the organization. And I do this by introducing them to action learning. 
And Action Learning is kind of a, a mini, miniature learning organization. So that I say, if you want to become a learning organization, what you want it to do is to have every project, an urgent project, become a learning organization. So in Action Learning, uh, they, they identify, because organizations continuously have challenges and problems that they have to encounter, which forces them or to become a learning organization, but they don't know how to move from that environmental challenge to becoming a learning organization as a large entity. It's too difficult, too large, and too slow. So you do it by piecemeal in a sense. You take a particular urgent problem and you use a small learning organization to respond to that problem or challenge. And then they see the immediate benefit of learning as an entity and they begin applying it so that you begin having a culture in the organization in which every leader is recognizing the value and the application of learning to a project. Because you, you have to get learning connected to a challenge or a problem or a task that the organization needs to, to get uh, completed. So I have found that uh, the best and quickest way and over the past 10 years to get organizations to become learning organizations is to introduce them into action learning as the, 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 the substance for learning organizations. So how does action learning actually build organizations? Okay. Well, let me uh, first describe what an, uh, action learning is a group of people who have been tasked to solve an urgent or complex problem by the organization. And while they are working on this problem, they are not only developing strategies and actions, they are developing their leadership skills, their team skills, and their organizational skills. So solving the problems is short-term and long-term benefit for them, but developing these learning, lifelong learning skills and leadership skills while they're working on this individual problem uh, can go throughout the organization. So, as I mentioned earlier, to become a learning organization, uh, you have to, the center is that everyone in the organization is continuously learning, and they learn from the problems or challenges that are in front of them, either as an individual or as a group. And so they get a challenge or a task and say, okay, what do I have to learn in order to do that better than I've done in the past or do it for the first time? And so an action learning does it in a group because we realize Complex problems cannot be solved by an individual, be he a leader or a member of a group or whatever. They only can be solved by a group. And so complex problems get solved by the action learning group. But these people, they change their values, they change their assumptions, they develop skills that they apply on a day-to-day -day basis. And as they work in an action learning group, they see what structures are important from an organizational perspective. Uh, they see strategies that will help them learn. They do systems in that they recognize to solve the problem. They have to engage uh, the community or suppliers or other resources. They do it. They, uh, they capture at every action learning session, you capture ideas, strategies, knowledge that you can apply not only to the problem you're working on, but to other parts of the organization. And uh, so, it, this small action learning group is modeling what the entire organization can do. And the power of action learning is that you can begin practicing action learning within 15 minutes. And the application of it can be for the rest of the life of the individuals in the group or to the organization. Okay, in, in action learning, maybe should start with problem solving. When people are given a problem, the natural tendency is for people to quickly go into answers and make statements and try to persuade each other. So the immediate thing is to into action. In action learning group, we recognize that's not going to be effective, particularly if you're trying to find a breakthrough strategy and you're trying to develop teams and leadership. So action learning has some different assumptions, but just like the different assumptions between a manufacturing organization and a learning organization, so there's a difference between how tip problems are typically solved by groups versus how it's done through action learning. So in action learning, we recognize that really all deep learning in life 
whether it's an individual or an organization, comes from working on a problem and solving a problem. So for action learning or any learning to occur in life and organization, you have to have an urgent, complex problem. The more urgent and complex it is, the more action you have to have and the more learning that has to occur. Second, we recognize that to learn as a team, probably to act as a team, to learn as a team, there's a certain size that's important. You want to have at least four members, but no more than eight. Because you have to have people have to have reflective time, voice time, space time. They have to learn together as well as act together. And so we know that group size is important. Uh, we've all had experience of groups of 15 or 20, and they're never successful until four or five of them eventually take over the group. So the second element of a successful action learning is, is to have a appropriate group size. And you want people in the group who think differently. Unlike most problem-solving groups in which you only have experts, when you have financial problem, you have financial people. In marketing, you have marketing. In action learning, you recognize that you want diversity in the group and that marketing people think differently from engineers. And if you want breakthrough thinking, you have to have engineers in the marketing problem because they ask questions and think differently than marketing people. So the second important element for action learning is to have a group of four to eight people with different perspectives. The third element is that we focus on questions rather than statements in action learning because questions will help us be more creative. They will keep us focused. They will develop our team and leadership skills and they'll keep us from jumping to an immediate solution to the wrong problem to being sure we understand the full problem, the root problem, so that we get a strategy, a sustainable strategy that solves the real problem and a full problem rather than a symptom. Fourth, I think, element for an action learning uh, group to be successful is that they have to know that their action counts, that this is a problem for which actions needed and their actions will be applied either by themselves or by the organization. And there is action at every session, decisions are being made, and between every session, people have to take actions on their ideas, strategies, pilot testing things, and so forth, as well as actions on their leadership skills, because at every session, they're developing and practicing leadership skills, which they also have to apply between sessions. So there's action at the end and during every session. The fifth component of action learning is that you are learning as well as acting. Unlike other problem-solving groups where you only act in action learning, you are there for two purposes. Come up with great ideas, great strategies, but also to develop yourself as a leader, as a skilled person, to develop your team abilities, the ability to work in groups with other people, and to identify learnings, strategies, ideas, knowledge, whatever you need that you can apply to other parts of the organization. And the final component of action learning is that there is one member of the group who's been designated as the action learning coach. And this person's responsible to be sure that the group not only comes up with great actions every session, but they also are learning. We know that if you don't have a person designated for that role, the urgency of the action always pushes out the time value spent in learning. And yet if they don't learn, if they don't get smarter, they won't be able to solve this problem in a creative way and a quick way and so forth. So there's a person in the group who manages the time uh, to assure that each group will get into learning as well as into to action. They get the results. So this is a, uh, it can be designated, but the, the, the more skills that person has, the better it is. And so a group that uses action learning uh, and skilled action learning, they accomplish in maybe three hours what normally a problem-solving group might take three months to accomplish. What types of behaviors are you promoting within this type of action learning? What do these sessions sort of entail and how, what's the interaction like? What makes it so powerful, action learning, is instead of my energy, all of my energy being fo focused on getting you to accept my perspective on what the ideas are, strategy, problem, I spend my energy giving you the opportunity to convince me. 
And so much more time is spent on questions because we know that if you force someone to accept your idea, the natural inclination is to reject it, deflect it, or not hear it. But if I ask you, uh, Jennifer, what do you think would be a good idea here? What is your experience? And so an actionary is much more questioning. And when we ask people questions, we tend to like each other more. We tend to hear their ideas. We may not agree with it, but at least we give a chance for it to be heard. And so in action learning groups, you have much more reflection and questions because we know that the essence of all learning is based upon reflecting on experiences. You cannot learn unless you reflect, and you cannot reflect without a question either directly or indirectly in your mind or someone addresses to you. So the other behavior is that you show respect for each other and you demonstrate that by asking for their ideas and so forth. So in action learning, the people are much more respectful of each other. Uh, they listen better. Uh, they're more creative. Uh, they help each other more because we're here not only to solve this group problem, this organizational problem, but we're here to help each other become a better leader. So with the guidance of the coach and so forth, each person gets feedback, evidence, positive, always positive, on how they practice their leadership skills through that session. Because a leadership skill is something you can apply 365 days a year for the rest of your life. So solving the problem is maybe worth a million dollars to the organization. But through action learning, if we can develop five great leaders that will be in that company for 20 or 25 years, working on hundreds or thousands of problems during their career, that may be worth billions of dollars to the organization. So you build a strong camaraderie among the group. They care for each other. They enjoy it. Most of us detest being in problem-solving groups. They're <laughs> dysfunctional. They're frustrating. Right. People get offended. They get attacked. It's very competitive. Uh, right. Action learning groups are very enjoyable, very positive. People love being in action learning groups, and they are disappointed when the group has finished its purpose. How do you assess the learning outcomes in these situations? Is there a different way of assessing at the end what's come well, out? It, yeah, I think, you know, uh, every, every time an organization has a task or a problem, you, you assess it by saying, what is the benefit we've gained? Uh, have we increased sales or decreased costs or raised morale or expanded our marketplace and so forth? And so... In action learning, it's, you're very targeted. The, or, the, the group quickly targets where do they get the best leverage and the best results because the group always does systems thinking because of the questioning being asked of each other. So you, you do want to measure, and what they measure is oftentimes is much more valuable in a shorter period of time. But you're also there to assess the change in the team and change in the individuals. So... You, when they go back, or they, they might be working on leadership skills with 360-degree feedback, and they do it before and after. So you assess, are they a more effective leader? Uh, you can assess the power of this team. Uh, this team that normally would have taken six months, they now do it in six days. Uh, so you can measure that. Or you measure every idea, every strategy, and apply it to other parts of the organization. And so a, the greater a strategy is, the more applicable it is to you know, other parts of the organization, to other uh, similar situations. So you are assessing as in the traditional sense, but you're assessing learning as well as actions. Why did you write it when you did? And who did you have in mind when you were writing it? Who was your target? The history of writing that book goes back about 20 years when I, uh, I had worked around the world for 25 years and I became a professor uh, and joined George Washington University and had a center for organizational learning. And so that was my research area. My area of teaching was learning organizations. And there really was very little literature on it, uh, very little research. And, and most organizations never succeeded in becoming a learning organization. So being a professor did give me the luxury of being able to do best practice research around the world, uh, to do a lot of reading about what makes organizations effective. 
And so over you know a period of you know ten years, I was able to identify you know what makes an organization a successful learning organization. And for me, the market would be you know every organization needs to be a learning organization, whether it's a, an organization of three people or three hundred thousand. Uh, because I knew the environment was changing and that everyone had to be a learning organization. Every, and so uh, that was my audience. Now, typically within an organization, there are people who are designated uh, being responsible for that, uh, certainly the, the CEOs and the, and the vice presidents or the ministers or directors. But oftentimes within an organization, they would have a chief learning officer or a person, a vice president of human resources. So that would be my audience. Uh, I guess my audience also would be the typical worker who would like to work in a learning organization because it's much more exciting and fun and satisfying to work in a learning organization. So if 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 employees or consultants read this book, they might, you know, insist that their organization adapt some of these practices because that would, you know, retain them in their that particular organization. And what would you say would be the one big takeaway that you would want these folks reading your book to walk away with? The first thing to realize the importance of being a learning organization. Most people think, well, we can we can survive. We're doing okay. We just keep doing what we do, and we try to be smarter and faster than other people. But some organization realizes the power and benefit of learning while they're in action, while every problem they encounter, every situation they get better, uh, it it makes them much more successful in life. So I think one thing, the importance of learning for performance improvement for organizational success. So is there a particular case study that you think sort of demonstrates this concept for people? Well, I think there's a small number of organizations that have applied elements of the model of the learning organization. My model was taking the best of many organizations. So uh, there are few organizations that incorporate all of the five subsystems. And to the extent that they incorporate as many as they do and parts of them, that makes them more successful. But in the book, I identified several that I think uh, demonstrated many of the characteristics of a learning organization. Uh, One would be Whirlpool which uh, has been a very successful organization for the past 30 or 40 years. But they make an effort that learning is critical for every part of their organization. Everyone's expected to learn. Uh, The values and visions of their organization is committed to learning. And not only learning internally, but they continuously learn from their customers and their products. Uh, Their leaders are committed to continuously learning and helping the people around them to learn. Um, They have a good knowledge management system. They use technology well. So they have strategies to continuously improve. And generally, the more competitive the marketplace you are in, the more you have to learn to survive. Uh, Federal Express has been a a great learning organization from its very, you know, beginnings in the 1970s where they recognized that they continuously had to learn. They use technology in everything they do in terms of managing their knowledge, managing their customer service, uh, managing their learning, uh, recognizing that when people come to the organization, there's an expectation that they continuously learn and improve and that anyone can move up the organization as they increase their knowledge. Uh, So an an organization which I've done a lot of action learning with is uh, Sony Music, where they have all of their senior employees get involved in action learning with the expectation and results that they move back into their organization being different kinds of leaders who recognize uh, the importance of learning. Microsoft has had a very successful worldwide uh, application of action learning for their major problems, developing their leaders, uh, changing their culture so that they uh, you know, continuously improve every time they interact what is it that leaders can do to encourage people um, with these behaviors, to give them responsibility? Uh, you talk a lot about the importance of kind of giving them freedom and room. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think if leaders see that their primary role is to be a 
a learner and help the people around them to learn and being a mentor and a coach. And that if they continue to do things just by themselves, it's one person with lack of access to information and time and so forth. But if a leader can be developing the people around him or her, then he or she generates five or 10 or 30 people who have skills and ability beyond what they currently have. So I think uh, a leader has to always look for opportunities and create opportunities for learning. So for example, if you came into my office with a problem or a question so for me and say, well, what should I do? Now, if I'm concerned about getting results, I would say, well, here's what you should do, Jennifer. But if I'm concerned about learning, I would ask questions of you. And also, I believe that you are a learner. I said, well, what are some of your ideas? W would this work? Why do you think that would work? So I develop your skills, capabilities, and confidence while you're with me. So you don't come back again the next day and the next day and the next day, but you are you have developed skills and knowledge and abilities to help yourself learn. So when I have a meeting as a leader, instead of just spending all of our time with results and policies and sharing information, we take time to learn. So we say, well, has anyone had a great success this past week? How are we able to do that? Uh, does anyone have a challenge that the rest of us could work on and develop or skills as a team and become more effective as a team. So I think leaders have to see themselves as no longer being director, directive managers, but now we're coaches, mentors, and teachers. That's our most important role in a learning organization. What are some of your tips for managing all of this new knowledge that comes out of the learn, action learning process? What makes learning work is ability of people to see its applicability. So I think as a leader uh, and using action learning, I would always try to find tasks or problems or challenges that either the individual has or our department has or the organization has, because that's what presents learning opportunities. You have to have, without problems, there's no learning. Uh, and the greater the problem, the greater the learning. So. As a leader, I and we all, as leaders, there's continuous problems we face, challenges, competition, whatever it is. So I try to see problems as opportunities for learning. And so then once we, we have those, then you put together people, an individual, a pair, a group, whatever, to say, okay, we've got to solve this problem, achieve this task in less time, less cost, whatever, uh, and we have to learn how to do it better than we're currently doing it or it's something we're doing new. So while we work on it, we, we learn. And so a leader ideally could be an action learning coach with a few skills and kind of a different mindset so that when they're working with a group, they're just not just solely being a member or directing. They're, they're asking questions and doing some things that get the group and individual in the group to learn, uh, members of his or her team. So, uh, and then there's time spent at the end of a uh, conference with an individual, a performance appraisal review or a meeting saying, what have we learned here? What have we done well that we would like to repeat in future meetings or when we in interact with that customer again or we work in this particular environment? And what could we do better? Those are the two essential questions of life and and we start that from infancy and but it is a leader if I continuously asking people around me ask well, what are we doing well and what could we do better uh, then then it becomes natural because learning is fun there's no, nothing more enjoyable in life than learning something that enables you to do something you've, you want to do very deeply and and so forth all of us are born loving to learn and we action learn from the moment we're born. So when we're born, we have two problems that we have the moment we're born, two challenges. We want to learn how to walk, and we want to learn how to talk. That's all children universally, worldwide. And so they don't learn by having the, the parents teach them, okay, now here, make this sound or make this movement. Children do action learning. So every time a child makes a sound, the subconscious of the child is saying, 
Is that sound working? Is, am I getting more understood? Or how can I make the sound better? And every movement they make, they say, is that working, helping me? What am I doing well and help me getting to walk? And how could I improve that? Their subconscious continuously asks questions, which gets them to reflect and which gets them to learn. Because improving an action can only be done by learning. You cannot improve any action unless you learn how to do it a little bit better. And you cannot learn without reflecting. And you cannot reflect without a question. So innately, we're all endowed with this ability to ask the two most important questions of life. What are we doing well? And what are we, what can we do better? We don't ask questions what we're doing poorly. It's always what are we doing well. That's the natural question. And so until the age of two, all children use action learning. And they learn faster in life than any time after that. Because within two years, they could speak three or four languages perfectly without any grammar lessons or t adults telling them what to do. And they walk and jump and skip. And then at the age of two or shortly thereafter, when they can now verbalize their questions, they get discouraged from using questions. Their parents say, stop asking so many questions. You're embarrassing. So I don't have time and so forth. So children who naturally ask questions questions, reflect, and learn, now go from acting their way to learning, to learning how to act. And mm. so adults, teachers, bosses, right. tell them how to act. And so what action learning say, no, in today's environment, it's too slow, and you don't develop skills that way. You have to experience something, reflect on it, and learn, as opposed to being told how to do something because every situation is unique and different and it's too slow. So action learning really is the application of the most powerful natural way for learning and that's why action learning works in every environment, every culture, because it's the way all infants learned until the age of two. What do you think that education, what role does it play in more and more organizations starting to adopt action learning? Well, I think most educators see that their role is to teach others how to act. And we have the answers, we have the theory, research, knowledge, whatever. So whether it starts with parents, teachers, whatever, professors. So our role is to give people knowledge that we think they should have. And action learning would say, no, really the student has a better understanding of what their needs are in life, that what, what they're going to be facing when they go out that school door at an eight-year-old or a 28-year-old, what's out there, and what they, you know, and what they would like to do in order to be satisfied with life and to be successful in life, whether it's a, it's a human being who philosophizes or a worker who's a successful entrepreneur. And so the educator has to find out what is what is important to you? What is it you want to do with your life? What are some of your goals and interests and so forth? And then use that as the starting point and then provide opportunities for them to experience it, either when they leave the classroom or within the classroom. The best action learning is done by kindergarten teachers all over the world. If they experience something, the teacher gives them something enjoyable to do, and they're, they're active, and then they ask questions about it. Very experiential learning, but it's built upon you experience your way into learning. You act your way into learning. Because if we're taught how to learn, we tend to resist, deflect, reject, and don't learn it well. So as an educator, professor, or boss, I say, well, what is it that this person is facing? Challenges, problems, tasks, and they can help me identify those. And how can I get them to experience and reflect on it? But they're ultimately responsible also that we can't make them. We have to create independence. And, and people, if they, they have some successful experiences, then they tend to be more successful. And again, thank you so much for okay, your time. Good. And um, Okay, well, thank uh, you. I enjoyed this opportunity myself. And I look forward to seeing the video.